I'm in the village of Grey Townwell near the county town of Hartford and uh, I've got to say this is one of the most impressive churchyards I've actually seen in Hertfordshire. It's full of these lovely old gothic style tombs you know and it certainly betrays the amount of wealth or wealthy people that lived in this area back in Victorian times you know but um, and there are some not quite notable people in here um, but there's basically just one grave in here that I really want to show you um, and it's it's nothing like anything as grand as this or these ones you see around me and yet people come from all over to make a pilgrimage just to this grave if you've ever watched the film chariots of fire this grave will be of interest to you because this is Harold Abrahams. He was one of the main characters depicted in the film. He was born in 1899 and in 1999 he went to Cambridge University and he became the first person to complete the Trinity Courtyard run in the allotted time. Um, and that feat was depicted in the film. And of course in 1924 he won the uh, gold medal at the Paris Olympics in the 100 metre sprint. And believe it or not, this is one of the most visited graves in, here in the churchyard. Um, people come here from all over just on a, for a pilgrimage to see his grave. And as you can see, they put little mementos on the top in the form of stones. One of them's even got a, a little etching of an athlete on it. The church here at Grey Townwell is a, is, is a very small church and um, an undertaker who I was talking to recently says this is the one church he dreads doing a funeral in. He says because it's so small it's so difficult to get coffins in and out. I can imagine. This tomb here, which is close to the entrance of the churchyard, is that of uh, Henry Ware Esquire and his wife. Now Henry, apparently in the 1700s and early 1800s, was a major in the Royal Regiment of Horse Guards. Um, he probably had quite a distinguished career, probably saw action, you never know, but uh, you can't find out any information about him at all. His wife, on the other hand, is Mary Ware. Now, You've probably never heard her name, but 200 years ago she was a renowned poet and authoress. And um, there's a lot of information about her. Um, you can even still get her books, apparently. But she was well known for translating poetry uh, from foreign languages as well. Hmm. Mary Ware is even recorded in this um, old book of historic Hertfordshire and this, this one goes back to the very early 1900s.
I've come to an area in central Hertfordshire uh, where there's a group of villages called the Ayats. Um, Ayat St Lawrence, Ayat St Peter, Ayat Green, everything. And um, I'm actually passing through there uh, to go to one of the villages that's tucked away right out in the middle of nowhere up a little windy country lane. Um, and on the way I want to show you something interesting. This old trackway used to be a railway line. It was shut down during the beaching cuts in the 1960s. I've arrived at the tiny hamlet of Ayat St Peter, um, but that's not the actual church that um, I want to visit. That's a fairly modern one, that was built in the 1800s. Uh, the one I want to visit is over in the field, just over here. About half a mile outside of the village you come down this little narrow country lane and you come across this. Tucked away in this little tiny copse is the original village churchyard. Believe it or not, there actually used to be a small church here. It was octagonal shaped apparently, um, but it was demolished in the early 1800s. Um, and then the new church uh, was built in its place. Uh, but now, all you've got now is a derelict churchyard. But there's some fascinating graves in here. There's one over here I'll show you. This one is um, a military grave, funnily enough, and it belongs to a man called 
uh, Mr. Christopher Egerton Balfour, um, who was an officer in the the King's Royal Rifle Corps, um, and he won the Distinguished Service Order um, fighting um, in the Boer War. Apparently, he served at Ladysmith, and um, quite young when he died, only 31. Um, but he wasn't killed in action. He actually uh, came home and uh, he died. Apparently, he's quite ill. Mm. says here, served in the defence of Ladysmith. Mm. This one here is my favourite. It actually belongs to a Joseph Peacock Esquire who was a wealthy wine merchant um, in the late 1700s uh, and early 1800s. And uh, this is the family tomb. I mean, there's no amazing story behind the peacocks. Like, you know, they were just wealthy wine merchants. Um, research them, you can't find any sort of scandals or tragedies or anything. But um, amazing about this, um, this tomb here is that Underneath here is a huge vault um, where all the body, all the coffins and that were deposited. Um, and you walk around here and this huge slab here, um, unless you stopped and actually looked at it closely, you'd think it was just a grave marker, but it's not. Um, underneath this slab is a staircase that actually takes you into the vault underneath um, and it actually says on here entrance to the vault do you know I'd, I would love to move that and go down and have a look <laughs> entrance to the vault Anyway, I'm going to crack on to the next village. I've come to the tiny little village of A at St Lawrence, which is tucked right out of the back of beyond, up these little narrow country lanes, um, pretty much in central Hertfordshire. Uh, you've probably never heard of A at St Lawrence, but it's had a couple of residents who you almost certainly will have heard of. And one of them, well, there's a clue. Well, in case you haven't guessed it, this is Shaw's Corner, and this was the home of the playwright Sir George Bernard Shaw, who, uh, who lived here until his death in 1950. Now it's a museum and it's open to the public. The other famous resident was the golfer Nick Faldo, who used to live in that house there. That was until he learned how to hit a ball straight. 
a tiny little village this, um, or it's more of a hamlet, but it's incredibly popular. Um, you do get hundreds and hundreds of people come here every day, either you go walking, uh, visit Shaw's Corner, or there's a lovely pub just down the road there. Yeah, I'd love to go for a beer, but they've got a kids party on there at the minute and it's pandemonium. But, uh, oh. Well, this is the church of A at St. Lawrence um, in the village and <clears throat> believe it or not up until about 20 years ago you couldn't even get into this churchyard it was so derelict and overgrown access was virtually impossible um, but a, a group managed to get funding to come in here and restore it to some extent so now you can actually come in here and walk around um, and there's a couple of interesting graves just over here which I'm going to show you. This is the grave of a man by the name of Frederick Edward Gould Lambert, who is also known as the Ninth Earl of Cavan. And um, in the early 1800s, he was an officer in the Royal Navy, and he actually saw action at the siege of Sebastopol during the Crimean War, around about 1854. Um, and then two or three years later, he was involved in the, the bombardment of Canton in China during the Opium Wars. After his naval career, he became a liberal politician uh, for South uh, Somerset. And uh, he, uh, he was also the Lord Chamberlain of the House under William Gladstone's government. So. Quite, uh, quite a distinguished career. But there's an interesting grave just behind it as well. And this is his son, Captain Lionel Lambert, who was also an officer in the Royal Navy during World War II. He was commanding officer of a yacht by the name of HMS Grive, which was attached to the fleet air arm. And he actually commanded the, the yacht um, during the evacuation of Dunkirk, uh, where it was tied up alongside the quayside at Dunkirk, evacuating troops, when it was attacked by German aircraft. He immediately let loose and tried to sail out of the harbour when he struck a mine and the yacht just exploded and killed everybody on board. Well, here I am inside St. Lawrence Church, what's left of it, and you're probably wondering why it's in ruins. Well, that didn't happen by accident. Just behind the church here is a large Georgian manor house, and in the 1700s it was home to a man named Sir Lionel Lyde. And um, in the 1770s, he set about dismantling the church purely because he said it obstructed his view of the village and the surrounding countryside. But um, he half completed the job when the Bishop of St Albans got wind of what he was doing and ordered him to stop. But uh, sadly, the church has been in state, this state ever since. But um, he did try and make amends later, as you'll see. <laughs> 
compensate the villagers for the loss of their church, Sir Lionel Lloyd, some years later, set about building them a new one. Um, and it's right out here in the fields outside the village. But rather than build the church in a traditional style, Sir Lionel Lai did what a lot of Georgians did. He adopted the neoclassical style um, and he designed it to look like a Greek temple. It's quite impressive. But the building wasn't just designed to be a church. Sir Lionel Lloyd wanted it to be the last resting place for himself and his wife, who absolutely hated each other with a vengeance, by the way. And at the best of times, they didn't speak to each other. And at the worst of times, well, I should imagine life was really colourful inside that big old house. But um, the church was actually designed so that after death, Sir Lionel Lloyd could be separated as far as possible from his wife. So he's buried here on this end and his wife is buried right down the far end. It's families for you, eh? Oh well, kids party or no kids party, I'm having a beer. <laughs>
I've come to the village of Tewin uh, in central Hertfordshire. Um, the village gets its name from Tew, uh, the Anglo-Saxon god of war. And there's two or three graves here in this churchyard, which uh, I think you'll find interesting. This is the grave of the Right Honourable Lady Anne Grimstone, who was born in the 1600s and was always believed to be a devout atheist and a non-believer in the afterlife. And yet, on her deathbed in 1713, she is reputed to have cried out, If there be an afterlife, then a tree will burst forth from my body and rest my tomb asunder. And uh, some years after she was buried here, that's exactly what happened, as you can see. <laughs> anyway, Lady Anne Grimstone is very much enshrined in local history. There's a couple of graves just over here, and the names on those graves are world-renowned. This is the grave of the two famous aviators, John and Geoffrey de Havilland, and they were the sons of the famous aircraft designer, Sir Geoffrey de Havilland. And um, John de Havilland, uh, he was a sergeant in the Royal Air Force Voluntary Reserve in World War II, but he was excused service um, because the de Havilland aerodrome, which is just a few miles from here, uh, were very short of pilots. So, um, he went there to be a test pilot during the war and uh, in 1943 uh, he was test flying a Mosquito Mark 6 um, not just a few miles from here when it collided with another Mosquito and uh, all four crew members were killed as the planes broke up. Uh, his brother Geoffrey uh, he was also a, he was the head test pilot of de Havilland's and um, in September of 1946 he was test flying a de Havilland 108 Swallow um, doing high speed tests, it was a jet and it broke up over the Thames estuary. Um, the, the aircraft remains were found in the mud of the Thames and his body was found washed up at Whitstable in Kent uh, so a while later uh, with his parachute still intact. It turned out he'd broken his neck during the, uh, during the accident. Um, so, and they're both buried here. And of course this grave next to it um, is the grave of their mother, Lady Louis de Havilland. That's an interesting grave. Wow, I bet there's an interesting story behind that one. Apparently the church itself is believed to be haunted by two ghosts, one of them being Lady Anne Grimstone. Well, I'm going to leave Chewing now. I'm going to take um, a two or three mile walk cross country to another little hamlet where we're going to hear the story, uh, the sort of story you love to hear, you know, 
highway robbery. Let's go. That big old house you can see there, that's known as Queen Who Hall, and that plays a pivotal role in the story that you're about to hear. This is Clibbon's Post and uh, this dates back to a story that happened in the late 1700s and it revolves around a man by the name of Walter Clibbon. Walter Clibbon was a pie man back in the late 1700s. Now he and his two sons used to sell pies on Hartford Market which is just a few miles away but that was basically just a cover for their true activity because whilst they were walking around the market selling pies, they were keeping a very close eye on the traders. They wanted to see which ones were doing well and which ones weren't. And any that were doing very well, they kept an extra special eye on. Now one day in 1782, one particular trader by the name of Robert Whittenbury was doing very well. Now Robert Whittenbury was a wealthy landowner, farmer from these parts. And uh, on that particular day, he made over £200 selling his goods and his wares on the market. And this hadn't gone unnoticed by Walter Clibbon. £200 in 1782 was a fortune. 
So before the close of the market that day, Walter Clibben and his sons quickly packed up and they made their way across country to this point here. They knew Robert Whittenbury, they knew where he lived and they knew which route he would take to come home. So they lay in wait just here. Now their activities hadn't gone unnoticed during the course of the market day. Robert Whittenbury suspected that Walter Clibben had been keeping an eye on him. So he had his son William working with him that day. So he decided to send his son William ahead, basically to see if there was anybody lying in wait. Now, as William Whittenbury made his way up this lane, Walter Cliven and his son saw him coming. And even though they knew it wasn't Robert Whittenbury, who the, the person who they were waiting for, they thought, oh, we'll, we'll have this guy as well anyway. So they pounced on William Whittenbury. They beat him up and tried to rob him. But William Whittenbury fought his way out. And he ran down the lane and over to Queen Who Hall, the big house you just saw earlier. And that's where his uncle Benjamin lived. Benjamin was Robert Whittenbury's brother. Now he told Benjamin what was, what was happening. So Benjamin Whittenbury got hold of his servant, a man by the name of Shock North, and all three of them made, quickly made their way back here. Now Shock North armed himself with a huge gun. And when they got here, Amazingly enough, Walter Clibben and his sons were still here waiting for Robert Whittenbury. Now they confronted Clibben and his sons and a huge fight broke out. But during the course of the fight, Walter Clibben grabbed Benjamin Whittenbury, threw him to the ground and held him there. And while he was holding him on the ground, he drew out a huge knife and he was about to stab him when Shock North drew the gun and fired at Walter Clibben. And he hit Walter Clibben. Now, Walter Clibben's sons both disappeared. Now, what happened next, we're going to have to take a walk down the road to a little place called Bull's Green. Eventually Robert Whittenbury turned up at the scene with his horse and cart and he, and he found out what happened. Walter Clibben's body was loaded onto the cart and it was brought back here to the Horns pub here at Bulls Green which is just outside the village of Datchworth. But there's varying accounts about what happened next. One account suggests that he was dead when they brought him here but there's another account that says that he was still barely alive um, when his body was laid out in front of the pub and villagers from all over the area came to see who had been doing all the highway robberies in the area and they all crowded round Walter Clibben as he lay dying and they kicked and beat him to death. After that his body was tied behind a horse and it was dragged all the way down the lane back to the scene of the crime. Anyway, it's always handy when a pub comes into the story. Cheers. Oh, I needed that. There's got to be an irony to this. Pie night, Tuesday. Ten pounds. Robbery, if you ask me. Once they dragged Walter Clibben's body back here behind the horse, they dug a grave right here at the scene of the crime and they buried him. And um, the post was later erected basically as a grave marker, plus it also marked the scene of the crime. That's not the original post, it gets replaced every 20 years or so. But the gun that was used to shoot Walter Clibben, amazingly enough, is now on display in Hartford Museum. <laughs> 
I've come to the village of Wigington, which is near the town of Tring, right in the far west of the county of Hertfordshire. And this is St Bartholomew's Church. Now there's just one grave here I'm going to show you, and it's, it's a military grave with quite an interesting story behind it. This is the grave of Private James Osborne, who was awarded the Victoria Cross on the 22nd of February 1881 for his heroic actions at the place called Wesselstrom in South Africa during the Boer War. He apparently rode out onto the battlefield under heavy fire to rescue a wounded comrade. And um, obviously for that, he, he won the highest award. In later years, his Victoria Cross was held in the safe custody of the Northamptonshire Regiment to which he belonged. And um, in 1939, they were stationed in Northern Ireland. But when war broke out in September of that year, the Northamptonshire Regiment, for expediency, left all of the regimental silver, plus Private Osborne's Victoria Cross, in the safe custody of the Royal Ulster Bank. But on the night of the 4th of May 1941, the Luftwaffe came over and bombed Belfast. The Royal Ulster Bank took a direct hit and was destroyed, along with all the regimental silver and Private Osborne's Victoria Cross. Um, in more recent years, his descendants have made several attempts to get a replacement Victoria Cross, but these have been unsuccessful. But um, the Northamptonshire Regiment was amalgamated into the, into the uh, Anglia Regiment and uh, they actually had some replicas made for his family. So uh, at least it partly ended well. I've come to Boxmore Heath near Hemel Hempstead and uh, you might think that's a strange place to find a grave but believe it or not that white stone you see behind me is actually the grave of the last highwayman to be hanged in England. One night in 1801, a young postboy by the name of John Stevens was riding his horse across Boxmoor Heath and he was carrying a satchel containing over £500 worth of banknotes and bonds. Unbeknown to him, lying in wait was a highwayman and that highwayman was Robert Snooks. Now Robert Snooks knew John Stevens, they both worked for the same employer who just happened to 
not only to be the local landlord of a pub, but he was also the postmaster. So Robert, Sno Robert Snooks knew the route that John Stevens would be taking on his journey. And so, of course, he held him up at gunpoint here on the heath um, and deprived him of his satchel of money and bonds. He then made off to his native Hungerford in Wiltshire. But um, whilst the police were out looking for him, he gave himself away by spending large amounts of money in large denomination banknotes. And so, of course, it wasn't long before the police actually arrested him and brought him back to Hertfordshire to face trial for highway robbery. And um, he, was, he was brought here to the scene of the crime and he was hanged on the uh, 11th of March, 1802. Now, after he was hanged, they dug a grave right here, but they had a problem. They didn't have a coffin to bury him in. So once they dug the grave, they lined it with loads of hay or straw. And then they put his body in it, and then they covered his body over with straw. Um, and of course, then they left it. It was only a few weeks later that somebody donated a coffin. So they exhumed the body of Robert Snooks um, and then placed it in the coffin and then reinterred it right here. Now, Robert Snooks wasn't his real name. His real name was James. And they, they reckoned that the, word, the name Robert was simply um, derived from the word robber. But, uh, yeah, the last highway man to be hanged in England. For the last part of this video I've come to the Holy Trinity Church here in the village of Weston which is situated in central North Hertfordshire and um, this particular cemetery there are three stories that I'm going to tell you. This is the grave of a medieval giant by the name of Jacko Legs, whose story goes right back to the 12th century. Now Jacko Legs, who is reputed to have lived here in the village, was a scourge of local wealthy traders and merchants.
and he would often lie in wait on the highways and byways near the towns and villages here. Um, and when wealthy traders and merchants came past, he would jump out and rob them. But he wouldn't keep the ill-gotten gains to himself. He, he used to go out and sh um, share it with all the poor in the parish. So he gained the reputation of becoming Hertfordshire's version of Robin Hood. But Jack O'Legs also had a deep dislike for bakers, who in medieval times were notorious for selling underweight loaves of bread, often made with corrupted flour laced with stuff like chalk powder and stuff like that. So he would often frequent the local markets, in particular the market in Baldock, um, just a few miles from here, and he would walk around the market stalls examining the loaves of bread and any that he suspected of being underweight or didn't taste right, he would grab the table and overturn it, scattering all the loaves of bread everywhere. But he did this on one occasion and he came unstuck. All the, village, all the bakers now suddenly decided to gang up on him and get revenge. So they chased him through the market stalls um, and eventually cornered him in the, in the churchyard. With nowhere to go, they jumped on him and they gouged out his eyes and they were about to lynch him. But Jack O'Legs begged for one last request before they killed him. And that was to be handed his longbow and to be able to fire an arrow. And where the arrow landed, that's where he wanted to be buried. So they granted him his last wish. He fired an arrow and this is where it's supposed to have landed. Now, it's more than likely that Jack O'Legs' story is, was based on a real person, but obviously that over the centuries the story's become embellished and corrupted uh, to the point of being ridiculous. Um, in fact, the grave is marked out by two stones approximately 10 foot apart. And according to local legend, they had to fold his body in half to get it in the grave, which, <laughs> well, I'll leave that to you whether you want to believe that or not. Um, but so much of Jack O'Legs' story is obviously fiction. But apparently very, very close to here is the grave of another young man whose story is anything but fiction. And for his story though, we're going into the field opposite the church. In the early hours of the morning, on the 7th of August 1817, a young man was led from his cell in Hartford Prison and made to board a horse-drawn carriage. That carriage then began a 15-mile journey to the village of Weston. It was to be that young man's last ever journey. That young man's name was William Moles, and he's believed to have been about 18 years of age. Now, like many young men of his age living in villages, he was employed as an agricultural labourer, and they would spend most of the year dividing their time up around all the different farms around the village. But at some point in early 1817, William Moles was employed here on this farm near the church. But um, for some reason, the farmer sacked William Moles, either for idleness or perhaps he was just giving back chat or nobody knows the reason. William Moles took umbrage to this and he returned to the farm late one day and he set fire to haystacks, farm buildings and he destroyed a lot of livestock in the process and it's estimated that he caused over a thousand pounds worth of damage on the farm which in 1817 was an awful lot. William Moles was arrested and sent to uh, jail on remand. When his case came before the judge, William Moles confessed to the crime. 
in the hope that the judge would show some sort of leniency. But unfortunately for William Moles, leniency was in very short supply that day. He was found guilty of arson and the judge sentenced him to death by hanging. Now, it was customary for most condemned prisoners in Hartford to be hung at a certain place, not far from the prison. But it wasn't uncommon for the person to whom the crime had been committed against to demand that the condemned prisoner be hanged at the scene of the crime. Um, and the judge um, actually granted the farmer that wish, and hence the reason why William Moles was made to board a horse-drawn carriage. Now that horse-drawn carriage stopped at a point two miles outside of the village. William Moles was made to disembark and then board another horse-drawn cart which was draped in a black cloth um, and then it was brought all the way here to the field near the church. Um, and it must have uh, caused a lot of dismay and uh, shock to William Moles when he arrived here to find a crowd of over 5,000 people had gathered to watch him hang. Now, William Moles arrived here at 9am in the morning, but the hanging wasn't due to take place until 12 midday. So, for the next three hours, there was pretty much um, a village fate atmosphere here um, in the field. And um, poor old William had to sit there and suffer the humiliation and the taunts from all the thousands of people who come to watch him hang. Now, Hartford Prison had its own portable gallows in the event that any condemned prisoner needed to be hanged at the scene of the crime. And that portable gallows was actually transported to Weston along with William Moles. But the farmer told them not, not to bother using it. He wanted William Moles to hang from a tree. Now, when the church bells rang 12 midday, William Moles was led to that tree there. A rope was thrown over a branch and then William Moles was hanged. But according to the records, William Moles didn't die very quickly. In fact, his friends were becoming very concerned about the amount of time it was taking for William to expire. They apparently ran up to the tree, grabbed his legs and pulled as hard as they could to try and help him expire. After his death, it's according to the newspaper records, William Moles' body was taken down and buried in the churchyard. Um, and it was unusual for a condemned prisoner to be, hung, uh, to be buried in consecrated ground. Um, so nobody knows for sure exactly where he's buried. Now, the newspaper reports say he was buried in the churchyard, but historians don't, but don't know for sure. In fact, it wasn't uncommon for the condemned prisoner to be buried at the point where he was hanged. So it's quite possible if he wasn't buried in the churchyard, he could be buried somewhere by the tree. And that tree, by the way, even to this day, is still known as the hanging tree. My final story in this video focuses on this grave, which is the grave of the Clements family, who lived just outside the village. Uh, in particular, David Clements, uh, who died when he was less than 18 months old. Um, and his very brief time on this earth was cut tragically short in what was to become the darkest episode of the village's history. Um, but for his story, we need to go to the opposite end of the village. But to get to the opposite end of the village, it's much quicker to go cross country. 
I've come to a place called Warren Green, which is situated just outside the village of Weston. On Saturday the 26th of August 1944, the skies above these beautiful tranquil fields were alive with hundreds of American B-17 bombers. Now these bombers were taking off from bases right across East Anglia and they were circling over the village of Weston trying to get into formation in preparation for a massive bombing raid on the Brest Peninsula in France. Now American bomber formations were well known to have adopted a defensive strategy which involved flying in very close proximity to the planes next to them. Now whilst it was an effective defensive strategy it wasn't without its perils. The dangers of collision were ever present and at 9am on that very morning that danger became a reality. Two of these American B-17 bombers became so close together that the propellers of one aircraft chewed into the tailplane of the one next to it. A major catastrophe was about to unfold. Immediately after the collision, the aircraft both began to break up and plunge towards the ground. Any crew members who were able to immediately bailed out, but sadly half of the crew members couldn't. As the aircraft were falling towards the ground, with their wings breaking off, they began spinning and, and this created centrifugal forces which kept crew members pinned into position and they couldn't release themselves in order to bail out. And um, a few minutes later, the field you see behind me was just one that became a scene of utter carnage as the wreckage of the planes began to crash into the ground. One of the main fuselage sections of one of these bombers came down inside this wood here. This pond is actually a bomb crater. This is the impact point of one of the two aircraft. As it hit the ground here, one of the bombs in the bomb bay exploded. The aircraft literally got blown to smithereens and what we're left with is a huge bomb crater which has over the years filled with water. In fact, right up until the 1970s, you could walk in here and find bits of wreckage lying around in the wood um, and even bits of parachutes up in the trees that have been there for 30 odd years. Um, and just a few years ago, we found quite a few bits and pieces of the aircraft, including the pilot's cap badge, uh, which had been blown into two pieces from the force of the explosion. In the 1960s, a local farmer was ploughing this field when the front of his tractor just reared up. When he got out to check what he had snagged on, he found a pair of 50 calibre machine guns trapped under his plough, um, which had buried themselves in the field 20 years earlier. The roof of that cottage was also badly damaged during the disaster by an exploding bomb. It was probably one of the worst air disasters ever to happen in Hertfordshire and when you walk through these fields this day and age it's impossible to imagine that it was a scene of utter carnage and death. But dig beneath the surface and the evidence is still there. These are some of the fragments of the aircraft known as Ding Dong Daddy and the fields around here are strewn with them. <laughs> 
The plane that actually crashed in the woods on the edge of this field was known as Ding Dong Daddy. And um, parts of the wreckage were all over this field. And the ball turret was just over here. Uh, wing sections scattered around all over. But the other aircraft came down in another field just down the lane there. This field here is the scene of the second crash site and it's just a few hundred yards from where Ding Dong Daddy crashed. The bulk of the aircraft impacted just around here. But one of the crew members who was able to bail out as the aircraft plunged towards the ground was to become probably the unluckiest aircraft survivor in history. He landed on the ground just a short distance away from the, uh, where the aircraft impacted, but as he stood up to pull in his parachute, a piece of jagged wreckage came down from the sky and impaled him, killed him on the spot. Now you've got to remember, that these aircraft were gearing up for a massive bombing raid and hence they were all fully bombed up. As the two aircraft tumbled out of the sky they were breaking up in the process and of course many of the bombs were breaking loose themselves and they began raining down in the fields and woods all around this area. Some of them exploded and some of them didn't and it was one of the ones that didn't explode that was going to have terrible consequences for the Clements family, who at that time were living right there in this cottage you see behind me. But they weren't living alone, they had a guest staying with them, a 42 year old lady by the name of Florence Webb. And at the time this terrible event was taking place in the skies above here, she was bathing baby David in the living room when one of those unexploding bombs punched through the roof and killed them both outright. Now it's impossible to imagine the terrible scene, but apparently Florence Webb was decapitated in this terrible event. Um, but their, their death certificates also make curious reading. Normally a death certificate gives under cause of death illness or injury. Uh, but owing to wartime secrecy, in both cases of David Clements and Florence Webb, the cause of death is given merely as due to war operations. Now, there's also a tragic irony to this story. Florence Webb wasn't living with the Clements family out of choice. In fact, the only reason she was living here, in this quiet part of the countryside, was because she'd been evacuated from London to escape the bombing. When the recovery teams arrived to deal with the aftermath of this disaster, the bodies of the dead crewmen were gathered up and they were laid out here along the grass bank, right in front of the cottage, ready to be taken away. Some of them were repatriated back to the United States, but some of them were buried at the American Military Cemetery at Maddingley near Cambridge. Wartime secrecy also ensured that any news of this terrible event wasn't given any media coverage. And so, of course, there was nothing on the radio and there was nothing in the newspapers. The enduring consequence of that, of course, is that even today, very few people outside of this area even know about this terrible event. 
it's not recorded in the history books. And so, of course, their stories get lost to history. And that's why I'm here, because their stories need to be told.